Yo, what's going on, y'all? It's Cone back here again today with another episode of After the Buzzer, the show where I recap the NBA games from the night. Only have one game to go ahead and talk about, only one game on this slate, and it was the first ever championship game for the first ever NBA in-season tournament. It was the culmination of the past month and a half, two months or so of the NBA season leading up to this between group play, the elimination stage... It's been a really fun time. I've said a couple times on this channel that I'm a big fan of the tournament. I think it really helped elevate the stakes in the early going of the season. I felt like I saw a lot of people get more involved in watching the game that typically don't from just scrolling my Twitter time on talking to people in real life. I feel like it helped make names like Tyrus Halliburton a little bit more relevant. People are seeing these rising stars on a big stage. I love the concept of it a lot. I'm going to give my overall breakdown and takeaways from the tournament at the end of this video. So if you want to see that, make sure to stick around till then. But for now, let's talk about this championship game. Lakers versus Pacers, both undefeated up to this point through group play. And of course, the elimination stage as well. A battle of the league's best offense, a rising superstar in Tyrese versus one of the league's best defenses and established superstars in LeBron James and Anthony Davis. I was really excited to watch this one. It was a battle between two really fast paced teams as well. So I was expecting some pretty decently high scoring and we did kind of get that. Unfortunately, there was also a lot of whistles in this game, some kind of ticky tack foul calls. And I will say the crowd wasn't phenomenal. That's one of the things I want to talk about at the end of the video with the in-season tournament as a whole. But regardless, I thought the basketball was still really fun. The Lakers kept trying to separate. They would build up like an 11 to 10 point lead. And then the Pacers would fight their way back to make it a one or two possession game. But then the Lakers would extend the lead again. And we went back and forth that way for a little while up until the end of the game where eventually the Pacers just didn't have any more comebacks in them. The Lakers pull away and win this one 123 to 109, crowning LA as the first ever in-season tournament champions. LeBron James ends up being named the first ever in-season tournament MVP. In this game, he puts up 24 points, 11 boards, four assists, and two steals. Wasn't the best Laker in this game Anthony Davis was. We'll talk about him a lot in a moment. But overall, throughout the entire tournament, there was nobody else this award could go to other than LeBron. He carried them night in and night out, was consistently their best player. Some people on Twitter were trying to say, oh, it's rigged for LeBron. Anthony Davis deserved it. And yeah, he was really, really good in this game, but they don't make it to this point even close to it if LeBron doesn't play the way that he had. He was amazing, very deserved serving of the MVP, and I've already got a feeling that by the time LeBron retires, this in-season tournament MVP award will probably end up being named after him. I can kind of see it already. It's another accolade that goes on his long list of them. I don't know how much it actually matters. I guess we won't know for a while until the in-season tournament kind of builds up a little more credibility. There's some more history involved, but it is just another thing to go ahead and tack onto his resume. It's crazy the stuff that he continues to do at this age, leading the Lakers to this victory, being their best player over the entire run, being the Lakers' best player pretty much this entire season. I just don't understand how LeBron is still doing it, but he continues to. And the way that he is playing so far at this age is one of the many reasons why the Lakers don't make sense to me. We're going to get into a couple more in a minute, but he is one of the biggest anomalies in the history of the sport, if you ask me. Speaking of guys that don't make sense, Anthony Davis. Some nights he looks like a top three, five player on the planet. And some nights you're like, where did Anthony Davis go? He goes completely missing. Tonight was one of those nights where he looks like one of the best in the entire world. Puts up a 41 point, 20 rebound, five assists, four block performance. One of the most most impressive games I've seen from Anthony Davis in a minute. He was relentless, very aggressive on offense, knocked down a couple of jumpers, but for the most part was just continuously attacking that weak interior line for the Pacers. They really struggle against these physical, big bodied guys like a Giannis, like an Anthony Davis and AD recognized that he saw the weakness and just continuously kept attacking. I love this aggression from Anthony Davis. We see a lot of times where he gets passive, he settles for a lot of jumpers, isn't attacking the basket the way that we know he can, that he's capable of and being such a force at doing so. I'm glad we saw this version of Anthony Davis. He smelled blood in the water and he was aggressive. We need to see more of this AD and less of the great first half completely disappearing in the second half, Anthony Davis, that we've seen a couple of times throughout the season and really a lot of times throughout his Lakers tenure. If this Anthony Davis showed up every given night, the Lakers would be one of the favorites to win the championship. Like, I don't know what you do about him when he has nights like this, especially for a Pacers team that just lacks overall defense. Miles Turner was doing his best, but there was nothing he could do to stop Anthony Davis. And it wasn't just that. His offense was phenomenal, but his defense, as usual, was world-class. He was blocking pretty much every shot. He was this great interior force. Whenever someone would get by in the perimeter, Anthony Davis was there to get a block, to contest a shot, to alter a shot, to just deter guys from even trying to score at the rim or pretty much wherever he was standing. This Pacers team is historically the greatest offense of all time, according to offensive rating. They only put up 109 points in this game, and it was a overall team effort defensively. Like, this is a great defensive squad, but Anthony Davis was the anchor, and he was by far the most important guy in this scheme, just completely wrecking everything the Pacers tried to do. 
He's a transformative defender. He's up there in the top three of the defensive player of the year race. And if he continues to play like this, if the Lakers rise up the standings and they continue to be one of the top 10 defenses, he's going to make a case. I still have Rudy Gobert over him at the moment because the Wolves are the best defense in the league. But AD is going to make this a race, especially if he can play as many games as it seems like he's going to. He did seemingly tweak his groin or had some kind of injury throughout this game, which kind of left him a bit hobbled, but he kept playing and he played at a high level. So hopefully it's nothing too serious. But I just hope we continue to get this dominant, healthy Anthony Davis for a majority of the season. The Lakers look so much better when he's playing like this. It's just a matter of if he can actually be some type of consistent player. And if he can, the Lakers are one of the hardest teams to beat in the entire league. Also, while we're on the topic of Anthony Davis, I hate that his stat line is just going to disappear into nothingness. Like this doesn't go forward towards his regular season stats. It doesn't count as playoff stats, obviously. So it just kind of sits in a limbo. I guess there's going to be like a separate in-season tournament stats pool, but that feels weird and super niche. I understand this isn't a regular season game, but it's still kind of in that mold. I would count this towards the regular season stats if you ask me, or at least find some way to make like an overall postseason, like non-regular season stat pool that could include these games that could include the play-in tournament because those stats are also in limbo as well as playoff stats. I don't know. They need to find some kind of solution for that because this stat line right now is kind of just going to disappear into history at this point. Outside of LeBron and Anthony Davis, their third guy tonight was Austin Reeves. Puts up a 28.2 rebound, three assist performance. Despite being sick, his flu game of sorts, if you want to call it that, 9 to 15 shooting. He's been great since moving to the bench role. He's really found his footing after a rough start, and it feels like they found a niche where he fits really, really well and benefits the Lakers immensely. He is probably their third best player. Like he's very talented, but coming off the bench gives them a score, a playmaker in those minutes, especially with Gabe Vincent currently hurt right now, which hurts their guard rotation a lot. They need somebody to go out there, be able to put up buckets if LeBron and AD aren't on the court. And Reeves has been exactly that guy. He's really stepped it up since moving out of the starting lineup starting to build a little bit of a case for six man of the year. We'll see how he plays the rest of the season. And tonight, especially they needed that bench production because outside of him, nobody was scoring outside the starting lineup. Like they had 30 bench points tonight and Reeves had 28 of them. The only other two came from Max Christie off free throws. So the only guy tonight to manage to score off the bench outside of free throws was Austin Reeves, which it doesn't feel like you should be able to win a game when you play like that. But again, the Lakers don't make sense and they found a way to do so. Other thing that doesn't make sense, the Lakers shot two of 13 from three and won a basketball game in 2023. It's hard to comprehend the fact that that actually happened, but it did. I promise you, I checked the stats like 30 times to make sure. It was just a lot of bowling on the interior between LeBron James, Anthony Davis, Austin Reeves. They were getting downhill. They were continuously putting pressure on the rim. The Pacers defense is pretty weak, so there wasn't much they could do in terms of resistance on that perimeter, and especially when they got downhill. Basically, nobody was getting stopped. But this is just another example of how this team finds ways to win. They lock up defensively against one of the best offenses in the league. They get great performances from their two-star guys. Austin Reeves steps up every now and again. Some of their other role players have good games. They find ways to win. Even though it's not always the easiest or the least stressful path, they're getting W's right now, even though this game doesn't count for the standings. The Lakers are leading the tournament tied with Dallas and Denver for the three seed. They're game back of the Oklahoma City Thunder for the two seed. They've got the seventh best defense anchored by Anthony Davis. Feels like they're putting things together. They got great play from other guys tonight too, which replicates a lot of the stuff they've been doing in the regular season. D'Lo was solid with 13 points and seven assists. I've liked him a lot as their lead guard this season, been efficient from three, and he's getting a lot of deflections. He's not a great defender, but he at the very least is deflecting the ball away from ball handlers. He's getting in some passing lanes, which is a big plus for this Lakers team. Cam Reddish is really coming to his own as a role player in this team. He's been starting a lot for them. Being this great defensive wing, I loved a lot of the defense he played on Tyrese tonight, and he's consistently given some really tough matchups and executed. He hits some threes every now and again. Isn't the best three-point shooter, but he gives them a little bit of juice in that regard. I've really liked a lot of what we've seen from Cam Reddish. Maybe he's finding his niche finally in the league. Torian Prince also gives you some good defense. Some nights he hits a lot of threes. Some nights he can't hit anything, but those nights where he's hitting, he's lights out and the offense looks really good. They've gotten good play at times from Max Christie, Rui Hachimura. Uh, Jared Vanderbilt has been great as an energy guy, as a defender since returning. Also gave them some great defense on Tyrese tonight. Yeah, they're just putting it together. This Lakers team is looking better and better before the season. I call them a championship contender. I think they're starting to show a lot of flashes of that. I still do worry about the shooting. Again, 2 of 13 from night from deep. Winning like that is not going to happen very often. Overall, they're the 22nd ranked offense, 26th in three-point percentage. Just not a good outside shooting team. I know they can dominate inside, but in today's league, you have to be at least an average three-point shooting team to win. 
So I do want to see them get better in that regard. Maybe when Gabe Vincent comes back and he gives them some shooting, it'll help out. Maybe the guys find some rhythm or maybe they need to make some trades. I know there's a Zach Levine rumor out there, which would give them a premier perimeter score. I feel like the better path might be though, to just try and get some role players that can knock down some threes rather than trading a bunch of these guys that are contributing for a star because last time they went for three stars, it didn't really work. I'm just liking the look of this Lakers team more and more, even if they don't make any sense in the way that they win any of their basketball games, the way that their guys play. They're a very up and down team, but when they're looking good, they look great. And it feels like they're starting to put together more of those consistent great performances and starting to look the part of the title contender I thought they would be going into the season. For the Pacers, it's the end of a really fun run from them. Tyrese puts up 20 points, one rebound and 11 assists on 57% shooting. Three turnovers, which is a lot from him, as crazy as that sounds. He was perfectly fine, but it wasn't the dominant effort that we've seen from him over the past few games, which ultimately kind of was the difference maker. The Lakers did a really good job of limiting him for the most part, but overall thought he was still really effective. And the tournament as a whole was just so big for him establishing his stock in the eyes of NBA fans worldwide, announcing on a national stage that, hey, I'm one of the next up and coming superstars. And the Pacers as a whole showcased how good they can be, not just now, but for years to come. The big problem for them in this game losing was their offense, which has not been the case at all this season. They shot just 37% from the field, 24.4% from deep. You did get 20 points from Benedict Mather and 15 from Aaron Neesmith, 13 from Obi Toppin. Miles Turner really struggled in this game. I believe shot three of 11 and he ended up fouling out. Gave the Pacers no real resistance against Anthony Davis. He has to be better in these big time matchups. But overall, I feel like this team just has to find a way to add some defense and they're gonna be one of the better teams in the Eastern Conference consistently. But yeah, those are my thoughts on these two teams in the game itself. I wanna get into now just for a little bit, some of my overall tournament thoughts. Like I mentioned earlier, I really liked it. I thought it was an overall huge success. I feel like they did a lot of things right, gave us some of the best hoops of the season. I felt like there were stakes in these November, December games, which isn't always the case. I thought the different courts were fun, even though some of them did make my eyes hurt. I feel like they might want to tone it down a little bit next year, but I do like that there are different courts at the very least for these games. It makes it feel like an event. It gets people asking, hey, what's going on? It brings a lot of attention in, and it just establishes this as its own separate thing from the regular season. I like the tournament aspect of things as well. Single elimination tournaments aren't something that we really see ever in NBA basketball. So this was a great example of how that can work and be really fun in that regard. I also just like the fact that it's something else that a team can win, and it props up players that might not always be able to get on the biggest stage. For example, Tyrese Hall. Burton. We have this young star, the Pacers, who don't get a lot of nationally televised games. They force their way onto the stage. And now a lot of people know the name Tyrese Halliburton. I think that's a really fun aspect of things too. Overall, big success. And I really hope they keep this thing going for a long time. Couple issues though. First one, I feel like the crowd wasn't great a lot of the time in Vegas. When the Lakers were playing, the crowd was definitely better because I think a lot of people there are Lakers fans. They just recognize LeBron James 80. You know, the Lakers have followings, especially being over there on the West Coast. They have a big overall global fan base. It makes sense that the Lakers were getting hyped up in this game. But overall, I feel like for a majority of the games and even in this one where the Lakers were playing, the crowd wasn't the best. Maybe neutral site isn't it. Maybe they should just have the team that is the higher seed play the games at home. I mean, we saw with like the Pacers against the Celtics, the atmosphere was really electric for a game like that. And imagine if the Pacers went on to beat the Lakers like they were playing in Indiana for this one, the crowd would have been going crazy. It would have been a big accomplishment. I think that could have been really fun. And I feel like this neutral site thing kind of takes a little bit away from that. Maybe as time goes on and the tournament establishes more legitimacy in the eyes of casual fans, they'll care more and they'll go to a lot more of these games and the fan base will be a lot better. I've seen some people say that maybe it should change cities over time rather than being played in Las Vegas every year. Next year, you could go to like a Nashville or Seattle, like these places where maybe a new NBA team is going to pop up at some point. You could go somewhere in Canada, like say you go to Vancouver where the Grizzlies used to play, just places that have some basketball history and want to show that, hey, we can show up for a basketball team to maybe get an expansion squad in the future. I feel like that could be pretty fun. Also, the ceremony after the game felt a little bit awkward. It felt kind of out of place, which I think it's just because, again, this is brand new. The only real ever celebration we see is after the NBA Finals. So seeing this in December didn't sit super right with my brain, but as time goes on, I think it'll become more and more normal. I also would kind of like if it was a little bit longer. I saw this recommendation from S, who's a great reporter. He talks a lot about the Toronto Raptors. Definitely go follow him. But he gave some ideas that I really, really liked, actually. Uh, he said that maybe they should make teams play twice in group play to extend it a little bit. You could have the knockout stage leading to All-Star Weekend and have the final held on that weekend being another aspect of those festivities. I think that would be really fun. And that you could keep the group games on weekdays so you don't compete with the NFL playoffs as you get to that point with it being a longer tournament. I think that could be really fun. I did like that 
in the group play, it felt like every game was do or die. If you lose one, you're probably out. You have to try and go undefeated. I did like that aspect, but I don't think having them play eight games instead of four would be a detriment. I think having it be a longer standing thing all throughout like November, December into January and February could give it a little bit more legitimacy. It could give it a little bit more juice. And overall, it just makes more sense, I guess, if you're doing like a mid season tournament kind of vibe, because this is very early. But at the same time, I understand why they're doing this early because they want it to boost up the ratings in this pre-Christmas NBA which is typically when not a lot of NBA fans are paying attention. So I do understand the arguments for both, but I think this suggestion is pretty cool. With all that being said, those are my thoughts on the championship game, the tournament as a whole, and these two teams. We'd love to hear your takeaways down below. What did you like about the tournament? What didn't you like? And overall, do you think it was a success in its first year? I'm really curious because I feel like people are very split on this. Again, I'm very positive, but I know there are a lot of people that are like, I just didn't care. So we'd like to hear some different perspectives, but yeah, appreciate y'all watching. Leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed. Hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on future videos. I'll see y'all later. Real one, say back.